Spanning mountain ranges, dense forests and alpine lakes, the Fiordland National Park is some of New Zealand's most dramatic landscapes. Located in Te Wai Ponamu, the place of Greenstone, it was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1990. In its heart, the Manapori Hydro Station remains visible at West Arm on the edge of Lake Manapori. Fifty years on, the power station is still probably New Zealand Aotearoa's greatest engineering feat, and certainly it represents one of our country's most profound political milestones. It is hard to comprehend, from what's visible above the lake level, the sheer scale of the underground project that took 1,800 workers eight years to complete. Today, the environment surrounding the station appears almost untouched. Revegetation of mountain forest has grown over battle scars and lake levels have remained largely the same. The still waters of Lake Manapori reflects our nation's history in the power station that for over 50 years has been part of the natural environment and helped shape the lives of local communities surrounding it. The Manapauri power scheme generates hydropower by diverting water from Lake Manapauri into intake tunnels. The water then drops 180 metres down vertical penstocks, driving seven turbines. These turbines generate electricity, which is then sent to the surface via cables to the switchyard before it is transmitted out to the national grid. The machine hall can be accessed from the control building by either a 220 metre service lift or by a two kilometre access tunnel wide enough for large vehicles. The water is finally discharged from the power station by two 10 kilometre tail race tunnels where it is released into deep cove and doubtful sound. The idea of building a hydroelectric power station in Fiordland had first been thought of in 1904 when the area was first surveyed. In 1956, initial conceptual plans were revealed. The construction of the Wilmot Pass Road begins in 1963, where shortly after the construction of the powerhouse begins. In 1964, a tail race tunnel construction begins. In 1965, the Wilmot Pass Road is completed. In 1967, the powerhouse construction is completed. The following year, in 1968, the tail race tunnel is completed. In 1969, water flows through the station for the very first time. In 1971, TY Point produces its first aluminium. 1972, the power station is fully commissioned. In 1999, Meridian Energy assumes ownership of Manapauri. The second tail race tunnel is completed in 2002. Then the refurbishment project was completed in 2007. I've been involved in Manapuri forever. I mean, I first went down there as a school kid uh, with a mate doing a South Island trip, and we were lucky to get a ride across on the boat and go down into the cavern when it was in, only half excavated. So that would have been 1967. So I was 17 at that age. And so I went back in uh, 1971 as a student and worked at the station for my summer practical training. That was just when they discovered the tunnel wasn't performing. So I got involved in resetting all of the governors and setting the standards for the station so that it was safe and didn't overtop. And uh, that was a really uh, exciting thing for a young student. And then I came back to Manapuri in 1993 when I was made uh, Chief Operating Officer for ECNZ. And we were, we were seriously thinking about how we could increase the capacity of Manapuri and avoid all the waste from the pressure loss from the tunnel. And that's when the second tunnel idea was born. And then of course, when Meridian was formed in 1998, uh, we took over the contract early in 1999 as the second tunnel was just starting to be built. And then we went through systematically refurbishing the generators and, uh, and the turbines. I love it, it's a fantastic station. When we came here there were seven permanent families and as you can see uh, Manapuri has grown with tourism and the power station has contributed to the population growth. And we 
as local residents tried hard to get them to bring the village into Manapuri, where there was plenty of flat land and, and subdivided, put in the sewage and the water and the facilities, and then when the scheme was finished, it would, it, it would enhance Manapuri. But no, they went away out the road, eight kilometres or thereabouts, and built a, a separate village out there, which meant they had to transport all their personnel down to the lake to put them on the boats to go to work every day. The look of the lake never lost its appeal for the hundreds of married workers at West Arm who were able to live on the other side of the lake at Hydro Village. There they had services, shops, schools and housing for 280 families and they could enjoy everyday small town life. You were very much part of that system and there were huge number of mixes of nationalities, you know, the Americans, the Yugoslavs, the Tunnelers were what? Italian. Italians. Mm -hmm. And so the children had a very diverse integration with that. And that, that was really good for them. Working with um, so many multinationals is quite an experience. Uh, a lot you couldn't understand, or you can't hear it on the face anyway when it's the drills are going. There's no way it's all, you learn sign language pretty quick. There's just some bond there that you get working in a situation that's very dangerous, very dirty, very noisy, <laughs> and very wet. <laughs> I've also, I, what they call hard rock miner, not a coal miner, not a gold miner, a hard rock miner. You drill, you charge your holes, you blast, you mark out until it's finished, and this is clear, and then you start again, and again, and again, and again. It's like making a big highway. From the powerhouse, compressed air is piped into the trail race tunnel. While the Wilmot Pass Road is being carved out of the rocks above, this tunnel is boring up from Doubtful Sound to the lake. Men are working nearly two miles in from the tunnel entrance, four miles to go. Technology in the tunnel was very rudimentary and when you're trying to mark out where the, the next drilling uh, setup was going to be, you couldn't even see the face. So it was a bit of guesswork, but a laser would have helped it because it would have gone through the fog. There's a drilling jumbo with four story high lifter, first floor, second floor, third floor. 36 people to drive that bugger. See all the pipes? Air, water, wastage, clean water. It wasn't easy. Hey, boss. It was very rough, very dangerous job, especially tunnel after the blast. If you find a big rock loose, we used to drill the hole 10, 12 foot deep. They call it rock bolts. We used to drag them through, they put a steel plate, not the running to tie them up. Then we put steel mesh all the way around. Every, every blast, put steel mesh, stop the rocks from falling to the ground. From the main entrance to the tunnel to the low point, it was 144 feet below sea level. Many times, it was talking about to abandon ship because of the water. But uh, we persevered. At one stage, Water with a pressure of 900 pounds to the square inch was flowing into the tunnel at a high of 12,500 gallons a minute. There was no gravity fall within the tunnel. The pumping station at the lowest point of the tunnel, 130 feet below sea level, just had to keep going to get the water out. I was wet every day I was in the tunnel, every day to the skin. We come from work to the chance house, on the ceiling, just everybody used to have a hook, hook your clothes on, pull it up. On the heat camera, the heat camera, I said, drive to <laughs> The float plane used to, used to be to transport people from Invercargill to Deep Cove because the Wilmot Pass Road was not finished by then. It was still under construction. Once you're there, you're kaput, you stay there. There's no way out. I was with the Wildlife Service and then I 
started flying and I was flying um, to West Diamond Deep Cove in support of the scheme. They had the Wanganella moored in there in those days and um, we used to fly people in and out. And it wasn't the easiest place to come into because of the wind blowing down the valley and that. Mail, urgent equipment and personnel are flown in from Invercargill. At the west arm of Lake Manapuri, the construction camp expands to accommodate the hundreds of workers engaged on this part of the Manapuri project. Here, progress is being made on the tunnel that will give access down to the vast underground powerhouse to be built, 700 feet below the rocks. That's the first time I went down that tunnel when, before the powerhouse was built, they dug this cavern out. And, and I'm not kidding, we, we came out a little side tunnel that was probably two-thirds of the way up and you were looking down this big hall and there were clouds in there from the, the humidity and the, the a vast space that they dug out first and then built this power station. For the commencement of work on the powerhouse, completion of the Wilmot Pass Road is a top priority. In the welcome sunlight of winter, men working up from Doubtful Sound and men working from the Manapuri side draw near to each other. Most of the equipment for the underground powerhouse, turbines, generators, transformers, is so heavy that bridges along the overland route from Invercargill would be unable to carry it. To get it to Manapuri, this road is essential. If it's unloaded at Doubtful Sound, it will take only a 12-mile haul through the mountains to deliver it. Once they established the road, Utah, Williams and Burnett, they then put a barge here on the lake, will supply the barge and we, we done the towing. Uh, and all the material went in from here, the cement and all that sort of thing, all the immediate stores and supplies, and went across the road to Deep Cove. It used to take us sometimes 14 hours uh, in a day, 15 hours in a day, it was nothing unusual with um, load by the time you loaded the barge at Manapuri manually, towed it to West Arm three to three and a half hours and then unloaded it usually by backing a truck up to the barge and rolling everything onto the truck and trundling it away to where it was meant to go. And of course the power scheme really extended the tourism experience in Manapuri because you couldn't go to Deep Cove before the power station and so now you've got this ready access over to um, Deep Cove and, and that then opens up all the other sounds, makes it easier for the fishermen um, to get their pots and so forth in there and so it's been, it's had great advantages to the wider public which I think a lot of people don't really appreciate. From the outset and throughout the project, the conversion of the Wanganella into a workers' hostel in Doubtful Sound makes work on the project tolerable. I asked Jim, he was the chef there, and one of the chefs, and said, listen, said, when you cook steak again, can you put a bit of garlic? Oh, he said, we haven't got any of that stuff. I see, he said, I see what I can do. So, Two or three weeks went by, and he came out and make an announcement. Excuse me, something for the Italians. You got to cook your own. We got table steak and garlic. Come and help yourselves. <laughs> Conditions here are cracked, although the completed tunnel will be 10 yards in diameter when light. Matters are complicated by a complex system of railway tracks at the face, where every movement of muckers and trucks must be closely coordinated to prevent accidents. You charge the holes, the 16 people, 17 people, and everyone uses 25 kilos of jelenite. It wasn't easy. People lost a leg, people died because of it. Why they died? Because what we call a mist fire. When you blast, some charges might not go off. But if you don't see them, when you start drilling again, and you go on top of it, it go boom. And what that means? Goodbye, Charlie. 
your life depend on me, the tunnel, because I can't hear you, you can't hear me, you hardly see me. We hammering with the hexes, hammers, driving timber, wood, pegs. If I let you down, you might get killed. If you let me down, I might get killed. It's so easy too, not just like that. If I let the hex go, it's you, you're gone. Look, health and safety, when I started work in 1974, is, was, was, uh, it, it wasn't a term that you heard about a great deal. Um, there was no doubt your employer was concerned about people being safe, but, but it, it certainly didn't have the legislative underpinning that it's got today. And if you fast forward 50 years, it's a dramatically different world. And, um, you know, if you tried to build Manapuri today with the way we built Manapuri in the 60s, you'd be shut down. You know, there's 16 men's names on a bronze plaque in the tunnel at Manapuri. And they died to create that asset. And I think what, what a, a, an extraordinary thing to give your life for future generations. Each time you, you drill, you know, advance, then you, you get your survivor that it mark your face. And when we break through from Deep Cove to West Ham, we were about half an inch difference. By October the 22nd, 1968, there were only a few feet of rock to blast away in the tunnel. Senior officials of the electricity department Ministry of Works and the contracting companies assembled underground and New Zealand's Attorney General, the Honourable Ralph Hannon, fired the final blast. It was hole through, the climax of the Terror Race Tunnel project, an occasion for rejoicing. I was lucky enough to be on a shift that did break through, but to get there, some of the monkey business we might call it we got up to to make sure we were in line to drill the last hole and that included derailing a, a, a locomotive and so it took a whole shift nearly to get it back on the rails uh, it was legitimate of course um, but that put the next shift couldn't break through and the, the following shift couldn't break through we knew when we came back in the next morning night we would get it and when we got through there, there was all the uh, West Arm ones there wanted to come back the other way. So it was just, hey, we've made it. We were the ones. Great. <laughs> yeah. The first tail race tunnel was constructed by staff from over 22 countries and took four years to complete. Though stricter environmental constraints and health and safety rules would have extended the time to build the second tail race project, the speed at which the first tunnel had been completed is a true testament of the sheer hard work and determination of the original tunnellers. I spent the best years of my youth here in, in Fiordan, 13, 13 years. I was um, 17 when I came here as a, a, a young lad and I remember my uh, brother driving me here as a, a trialist trainee in the, this uh, magnificent field and national park, over three million acres in size, the largest national park in New Zealand, one of the largest in the world. We came over the hills entering Tianau and he says to me, there it is son, tiger country, real tiger country. And I said, yeah. And I had a 13-year love affair with, with, with Fiordland, and during which time uh, the Manapuri Power Scheme was, was built. And that's the thing that has astounded me the most, just how, <laughs> how non-visual the power scheme has become as a result of the removal of all the buildings and most impressively the, the regeneration of, of the, the beach forest. Even right up around the control structure I noticed that it's um, 
you know, it's it's greened up a lot. There's there's moss and lichen and, and little stuff growing on what was bare rock and had to be bare rock to build the thing. But it's greening up and, and blending in. You know, I commend the landscape architects that no doubt were engaged to ensure that the the seed was genetically sound, related to the area and, and tended to the point now when you arrive by boat. What looked like a bomb site uh, many years ago is now blends in very well with the, the natural scenery that, that surrounds it, so full marks to everyone that was involved. It is a very, very special place because the engineering is quite unique, it's quite dramatic. Uh, it was quite challenging. But it's also an extraordinary environmental success because the way the lake is managed today has preserved the natural character of the lake. The lake shore is the way it was. The Manapuri Guardians do a fantastic job looking after the lake and, you know, as an operator of the station I was incredibly proud of the combined environmental outcome and the energy outcome that we got. In 1971, the government made plans to dam the Waiau River to raise the level of Lake Manapouri and to increase generation from the power station. In 1973, the guardians of lakes Manapouri, Monawai and Te Ano were created to oversee the management of the lakes. This guardianship continues today. The focus is on good science, and, and science that's fit for purpose, and that's, that's what the original Guardians wanted and developed, and that's what we still look at today. And whilst our science is more, more finer grained in a lot of ways, it, we still look for more, and we're, we're certainly a little less suspicious. We, we have a more collegial relationship, a, a lot more trust, but there, there's still elements that are at times adversarial, but there's a lot more respect there as well. The guidelines were developed back in the um, 60s and 70s based on previous 30 years of records that were kept of the, of the natural fluctuations of the lakes. And so the guidelines state how high the lakes can be, how low the lakes can be, and how long they can be held in each of the ranges for because that affects the vegetation around the shoreline and, and can at times affect the stability of the shorelines as well since then the environment has changed significantly and not just the natural environment you know along the lines of climate change but um, the, the legislative environment, um, compliance, there's been a treaty settlement since then as well. The energy market has changed and so there are a whole lot of things that have changed and we just want to be able to review the guidelines to ensure that they're still fit for purpose. It's a massive job. These are Lake Tiano, you know, is the second largest lake in New Zealand, and then you have Lake Manapouri on top of that, and then Monawai as well. And these are, are big and complex schemes that operate on the lakes, particularly the West Arm Power Station. And these are important, globally significant parts of the world. So the work that we do as guardians is is really important, and so we try to commit the time to do our best for those environments. I was always passionate about the outdoors and being a, a national park ranger I obviously cared for the environment and when when the project came along that was talking about raising the lake by 27 feet um, that didn't sit well with me at all and unfortunately it didn't sit well with many other people in New Zealand and that was I would argue the the beginnings of the conservation movement in, in uh, in New Zealand and there were some very astute people came on board, you know, pe people like Dr Alan Mark, Professor of Botany at Otago University and uh, a number of other people. The six guardians were chosen from among those who really led the campaign. Uh, I've called them the cream of the rebels, which I think is a fair assessment. And the terms of reference we were given were very wide. They were to advise government on operating the lakes, 
so as to uh, ensure the uh, environmental and recreational features of both lakes, Manapuri and Tiana, were retained. Uh, there was no mention of the hydroelectric potential of the lake. That wasn't a matter for us to consider, although clearly it was important. And uh, also, we were to be given uh, free access to any official information that we thought was important to us. It was only latterly in the construction phase that it became apparent they were going to raise the lake. It wasn't part of the original scheme of things. It was, yes, a late agenda, so it was a bit of a scramble to wage the war to save our lake, yeah. A lot of us were busy with family and, and doing that side of it. Cliff was obviously extremely busy towing up and down the lake until all hours of the, the day and night sometimes. So you, your involvement was perhaps, if you could, you would, you would attend a march, which were held in Tiana mostly, and there was a gathering here in Manapuri to show the levels and there's a rock up there which um, marks the level it would have come to. And so it's quite clearly marked and there for everybody to see. And, and people are really quite astounded when they see how far that the lake would have come up to. So it was important and it was certainly effective. I was the National Parks representative on the Guardians of the Lake and we used to meet regularly. Uh, and we took every opportunity to show people of um, importance, uh, relevance, the, the shoreline of Lake Manapuri and, and how it would impact on the environment and how far up the valleys at 27 feet would go and the destruction that that would cause the environment and not only that, the eyesore and the impacts of, on, on tourism that that would have. When I was at university, there was Sir Alan Mark was one of my lecturers. So, yeah, he was you know, very passionate. Um, he had a bit of a spark on his eye when he talked about the Guardians. So that, that spread my interest in being involved. They secured 10% of the country's um, votes petitioning to stop the campaign. They had a lot of mana and you know they had the social license from the community. And I, I think the you know, community is very proud. I think Southland is very proud. And, I think collectively as a country they're very proud of that moment. They generated so much feeling around throughout New Zealand by people that have never even been here. And but they seem to think, well, you never know. I might go there one day and I don't want my children to miss out on on this pristine lake in the middle of the national park. And so, you know, it was it was really quite a a, um, a moving time. And of course, you know, we all bought certificates to help the cause <laughs> and paid 50 cents for a various certificates. We have a, a very important saying in New Zealand uh, as far as conservation is concerned. Uh, it is simply that we haven't inherited this land. We've just borrowed it from our children. If people had not sacrificed what they sacrificed in terms of their time and their families and their businesses, like I know that Grandad just poured dollars and dollars and time and time over many years into trying to raise awareness of the issues. And if that, if he hadn't sacrificed what he sacrificed, then we just wouldn't have what we have now. It's not until you get into the electricity system that you see how exciting it is and how much challenge it represents. It is, it is, a, it is a very complex industry. It's complex in the sense that it's technically sophisticated, even though the engineering is heavy engineering. I mean, it's not like electronics, but it is quite technically sophisticated. And yet it's got strong economic overlays, it's got strong social overlays, it's got strong environmental overlays. All of these have to come together to solve you know, what is actually one of the highest service duties of any supplied good. I mean, we supply any amount of electricity, any time, at a fixed price. 
That is an extraordinarily high standard and we can't afford to fail. So it takes 10 years of planning to deliver the energy this split second. And, and so it's a very, very challenging industry with many, many aspects. We found there was a person that wanted severance down in Manapuri. So there was two of us applied for the job. I was fortunate to get that job and I've been at Manapuri ever since, 23 years. And I progressed up into the operating position. Station operator is that we were sitting and you were controlling the station. It's different to the uh, first days. We didn't have remote control and computers. It was all manually done. And that's when you got to know your machinery. And uh, when you're starting them, sinking them, you had endoscopes going and you had to time it or shake the dust off the station. There's this new transformer we've got, the SEF6, up in the switchyard, where we bring our local service from 220 down to 11 kV. The SEF6 full transformers, which is a first for New Zealand. So this transformer uses uh, sulfur hexafluoride gas rather than oil to insulate the internals of the transformer. Um, so that's, that's pretty unique. It means that we can uh, install it without firewalls and without any oil management equipment and also keeps the environment safe here. It is a good industry to join. You can learn a lot and it's, um, it's always going to be ongoing. New things will be developed. Oh, we've got a fleet of six EVs on site. They're perfect for around here. We, we travel short distances up and down the tunnel and got a lot of power, so it uh, makes perfect sense and everyone enjoys having them on site. At school we have a co-curricular week and for that we have two days of work experience and my gateway teacher who was organising we would all be placed asked if I wanted to potentially go back to the power station and I was really really keen so I was getting up at 5.30 but I just I didn't even care about the early morning starts it was just I got to go to Manipuri power station for work experience I mean who else gets to do that? because it just really reinforced that I wanted to do engineering. I'm growing up now and that's what I'm going to do. I think it's definitely a big thing that there's so much gender diversity now because back then it would have been male dominance, whole thing. And now there's a couple females coming in and it's slowly getting more and more 50-50. I think that's awesome. The Waio and the Waitaki catchments, where Meridian generates its electricity from, are natural habitats for thousands of native longfin tuna or eel. Tuna are a tauma species for Ngaitahu who have mana whenua over these two catchments. To provide a sustainable tuna population, the trap and transfer program was developed in partnership with Ngaitahu and ensures thousands of tuna are moved. Juveniles or alva are moved into dam headwaters and mature adults are moved back downstream below the dams. The trap and transfer program came in, into play as around the mitigation of the Manapodi uh, power scheme and it's all part of Meridian's mitigation package to ensure the others are caught and released past because they can't get up over these weirs and dams and those sort of things so so that's the uh, the mitigation factor that we're, what we're doing is meeting those requirements on a contractual arrangement with with Meridian. This ramp sits in the water the, and it creates a sort of like a assimilates a stream and of course the eels swim into it they don't swim with it they swim against it you know and they work their way up using these bristles to assist themselves to get up they get up over here to the end where the water is and they come out here 
hit that and they're in there. The average catch over a, a year is around about 500 to 600 kilos, reasonably consistent. The fact that the, the, the eels or the tuna, in terms of naitahu whānau, whānui, that's the Tonga species. And so we want to sort of grab hold of all of that stuff and, and kind of keep a, a, a good uh, up-to-date management of it all, you know. Water is fundamental for the generation of hydroelectricity. As the global climate changes, so does the flow of water expected into the Manapouri catchment. Modelling at Meridian Energy forecasts what effect this may have on the power generation of the station for the future. We've seen quite a few changes already in the Manapouri catchment due to climate changing. We've um, noticed that autumn inflows have got a bit drier and we expect to see a lot more changes in the catchment in the future. 8% of annual inflows into the catchment are from snowmelt and under climate change we expect to see uh, snow lines rise and therefore we might see uh, less water stored as snow in the catchment, slightly higher winter inflows, slightly lower summer inflows uh, and some parts of the catchment will get wetter and some drier so we're expecting the, the west coast to get up to 20% wetter if we have high emissions and um, up around the sort of eastern part of the catchment, Lumsden, uh, Athol, that sort of area might get quite a lot drier. Environmental issues have become very to the fore and, and children are taught from an early age and I think it's important that they are so that they do know to look after. And we've got some big issues coming up with climate change, haven't we? How much greenhouse gas or gases does New Zealand put into the atmosphere every year? Here's a question for you. All right, I'll tell you, a little bit less than that. It's 80 billion tonnes a year. So we are a fully renewable generator. So we only make electricity from renewable sources. So we don't burn coal, we don't burn gas. But even with that, even though we're fully renewable and doing the right thing, we still have our own emissions. So that 37,000 tonnes, we're going to offset by planting trees. So we're going to plant a forest across New Zealand. And we're starting today at Manapari Lake Control. I love the environment and I love everything about it. And I really want to be out there to save it because climate change is coming, there's no stopping it, but we can slow it down. And first we need the information to know what we can do to slow it down. So everything from looking at what's in our lakes and rivers and oceans to surveying populations of animals in the bush. And over the last three-ish years, we've been working on an underwater rover and we're really happy that it's running smoothly. And so all this data does help in the long run to get to hopefully the goal of having a safe, healthy place to live in for the future generations to come. The most important part of this beautiful, big, iconic uh, catchment and, and hydro scheme is that for New Zealand to be able to decarbonise, what our modelling shows us is that we need to have those big hydro schemes as the battery bank. So as we get rid of our coal stations in New Zealand, um, and to lower emissions. We're going to find that we build more wind farms, we're, going, we're expecting to build some grid solar, and as that happens, the uh, electricity supply becomes a bit more intermittent. So in the evening when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, it's harder to keep supplying the power so that everyone can keep their lights on. And the, the advantage we have in New Zealand is these huge, iconic hydro schemes so that when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining, we will use the water. And when the wind and sun are producing electricity, we will hold the water back in the schemes. And so we envisage from our modelling that we will be able to get to very high levels, 95, 100% renewable in New Zealand 
over the next 20 years because of these fantastic hydro schemes. So it's really important for us to retain these. We don't really see that there's going to be any new big hydro built because um, it's hard to get consent for flooding beautiful valleys, so that's good. But the scheme has a really, really important part to play, a vital role in New Zealand becoming uh, low carbon. Well, look, electrification is the future, and we can't stop that. Uh, fossil fuels are going to be phased out. You know, uh, transport's going to rely on electrification. We, we need a, a lot more generation potential to be able to do that. So, you know, you have to embrace it for what it is. It, the scheme, it, you know, at the time, there was an environmental footprint, but, but now it, it sits in that environment pretty well. And I'd like to see it continuing operating and contributing to the country. The station was constructed to supply power to the TY aluminium smelter down in Southland. So we've got a contract with TY until 2024 and beyond that they're looking at hydrogen plants, um, data centres and converting boilers on industrial sites to electricity. The incredible vision that engineers had in the 50s and 60s to build those plants, to build them well, to build them with sort of 50 percent capacity factor to give them that flexibility to respond to demand, that's an extraordinary asset for New Zealand. And we don't, I don't think New Zealanders appreciate enough how wonderful that asset is when you compare it with, you know, Australians' coal-fired power stations. And, you know, the Australians are facing a massive transformation where their, their coal-fired stations will close in the next 10 years. And they've got to go almost entirely to a renewable system which they've never experienced before. So we've been very, very lucky as a nation. I believe the electricity industry is entering the most exciting period in decades. Renewable energy really is at the forefront of how Aotearoa New Zealand is planning to be decarbonised across a whole range of sectors from process heat, transportation and electricity. Manapauri Power Station, a real gift that was given to us by past generations, is only going to become more and more important into the future. In the 50 years since renewable energy was first generated from the Manapori power station, New Zealand Aotearoa has changed, and so have our energy demands. For more than half a century, this unique and inspiring power station has formed the backbone of New Zealand's electricity supply, and going into the future, it will remain a critical part of New Zealand's infrastructure. We thank all of those who helped build the Manapori power station and who have helped maintain and operate it since ensuring this amazing station remains a pivotal part of New Zealand's clean, green energy future. Thank you.